Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Hi, I'm Kyle Carosa, the Kyle of TV's Kyle. And you're listening to Otaku Generation. And I'm playing with my chicken bear. Book, 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 What's reach? What's bank? Well, you know who to thank. Welcome to show 855. Hi, everyone. I am Alan. I am Matt. And I am Paul. What's Freesh? What's Bank? What's Squeak with the OG crew? So what did I do this weekend? I played a lot of Stardew Valley. I did a lot of grinding uh, to accomplish some particular elevation, like upgrades and stuff to the farm. And I, I spent uh, quite a bit of hours on Saturday. Uh, <clears throat> I had to get up early, so I did that. I did all those things. Then, uh, then I spent a bunch of time in Stardew. Today, what did I do? I played... A little bit of Minecraft for, I don't know, maybe not even an hour's worth. Okay, well, I don't really have that much to talk about, so I was just baiting you to fill time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's okay. All right, well, Paul, what about you? Uh, let's see, what about me? I'll keep it fairly short as well. Though, actually, did I talk about Free RPG Day last week? I can't remember. Well, let's assume you didn't. <laughs> let's assume I didn't. Okay, so last <laughs> week was Free RPG Day on Saturday, and... I had uh, vaguely remembered this and had wanted to pick up a copy of the Twilight Imperium uh, preview that was being released by uh, Fantasy Flight Games for the Genesis system. Oh, okay. Uh, so I stopped. So I stopped in, and I. So this is a. It's a Okay, so I stopped into the store and I totally forgot it was free RPG day and started looking at other stuff and ended up getting a copy of a game called Heart uh, by Grant Howitt, which is like this really weird, dark uh, dungeon crawling game where you go into uh, just this, you know, horrible, fleshy, twisted place underneath a city to, you know, face your worst fears and hopefully make some cash. And it's just a, a lovely book. Um, the same author has released a bunch of one-page RPGs, but also another uh, game called Spire, where you play dark elves fighting back against the uh, oppression of the high elves who have uh, sort of taken a fascist control over your home. And, you know, I just haven't what? felt up to playing in a fascist regime, you know, as an underdog uh, uh, resistance fighter for quite a while now. And so, so I figured I'd give Heart a try. But as I was heading out the door, the clerk reminded me that it was free RPG day. And if it, would I like to take something? And I said, why, yes, I would. And uh, so when I asked him, you know, kind of tentatively, could I take also, in addition to this copy of Twilight Imperium, a copy of this Dune preview? He said, oh, sure. Take whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I came away with a huge haul of stuff. So he took out the box of stuff that was also from the last last three years free RPG days. Uh, so I ended up with just this massive haul of like quick starts for Dungeon Crawl Classics, uh, Unknown Armies, Overlight, Cosmic Patrol, uh, Talisman. There's actually a, a Talisman uh, RPG now based on mm -hmm. the extremely dubious board game that I played way, way, <laughs> way too much of in college. Way too much of. A uh, terribly balanced game, but still nonetheless fun. And um, and also a copy of the Star Trek Adventures quick start from Modifius. Okay. So this is the uh, the newest Star Trek role-playing game. Uh, it came out, I think it's it's been out a while, like 2016-ish, 2017, somewhere in there. Okay. Uh, is the focus on this um, character role play or spaceship battles? 
It's um, on emulating the Star Trek TV show, I'd say. Okay. So basically, if you see it in the show, this game wants you to be able to play it. Starship battles, sure. You know, not so much at the miniature combat level, but, um, you know, so they've got source books for command division that give you, Mm -hmm. you know, extra extra things about diplomacy and negotiations and you know the the science uh, division supplement for investigating your your wormholes and sp- spatial anomalies as well as medical and so on so they have uh, oh. they, basically whatever character you want to play that original series era or new generation to uh, voyager era this game apparently wants to give it to you oh that's kind of cool actually so I, this game had totally not been on my radar. I knew it existed. And so I got the, the, the quick start. And I started reading it. And I'm like, you know, this actually looks kind of fun. And so I started looking at their website and all these supplements. And there are so many supplements for this game. At this mm. point, they've got, you know, in addition to science command and operations division supplements, they have one for each of the quadrants. Um, Alpha mm-hmm. through Delta, and they just came out with a, the Klingon Empire one fairly recently, oh, uh, which oh, looks oh. pretty good. But the one that really caught my attention, oh, and the one that said, "You know what? I just want to buy every supplement for this game and start playing it," is their new Sandbox campaign. So the physical books I think haven't shipped yet, but it's set in the Shackleton Expanse. Okay. And the, the Shackleton Expanse is more or less the region of the galaxy that uh, the rights holders at, uh, I guess, Universal gave to Modiphius and said, here, you know, you can do whatever you want in this area. So so this is like a book with uh, just like this massive sandbox centered around uh, a particular star base that's the only uh, jointly administered star base by the Federation and the Klingons. Mm. And I mean, that is just like a perfect setup for a Star Trek series. You know, it gives you any number of hooks. It gives you conflict. It, I mean, just it, it, it sounds so absolutely perfect. So uh, so I got super excited about it. And actually, earlier today, I drove out to the uh, uh, my friendly local game store and mm-hmm. picked it up. So not Yay. the Shackleton Expanse, sadly. I'm curious where your local is. Is, is it uh, the one near me? Yeah, it's the complete strategist. But, yeah, yeah. Though actually, I try to split my 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 money between the complete strategist and showcase comics. Yeah, so uh, I uh, I haven't been to well, I've been to either in a very long time, but I haven't been over to to complete strat in a while. Showcase was in the mall. Where's it now? It's still uh, in the mall, so, isn't it? No, there's a, there's a different little show. There's a different comic store. It's not showcase. Oh wait, that's uh, that's the uncanny comic store, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So there are actually two showcase comics. There's one um, down somewhere to the south. I can't, Swarthmore maybe. But mm-hmm. this one's in Bryn Mawr. It's like in downtown Bryn Mawr. Right. Not anybody yeah. I podcast oh, that okay. knows where that is. Uh, yeah. But it's uh, mostly a comic store, but they actually have a fantastic assortment of independent ro- role playing games and you know, larger publisher role playing games as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So between the complete strategist and the uh, and, and showcase comics, the one they, they tend to stock slightly differently. So I can almost always find like different supplements at each one or out of print games. So like when I was buying up the Dying Earth role playing game, I yeah. was able to you know over the course of like you know three years slowly buy up these out of print role playing supplements one by one because nobody else is buying the Dying Earth role playing game apparently. So hmm. well, they're lost. Yes, indeed. But at the moment, I am super excited about Star Trek Adventures, and I'm going to need to figure out how to get a game of this together mm. because it just looks like fun. Awesome. Just tell me one thing. Just tell me yes. one thing, man. Okay. Can you have triple player characters? That's all I need ah, to know. Okay. So actually, <laughs> just yesterday, I was looking and I have found a fan supplement for triple player characters. <laughs> So I'll I'll send it to Alan so I can go into the show notes and I'll send it to you as well, Matt. So I was just asking because I thought it was such a facetiously silly thing that it was impossible. <laughs> I, I, I think it's going to be a while till you get the official triple player character uh, species uh, support, but, but but it's out there. So like if this is what it takes to get in the game, Matt, we can do it. But 
Trebles have no limbs and no abilities. All they do is eat and breed. How can you make like an, a character with agency out of that? Breed on top of things until they die? Well, yes, basically. <laughs> Engulf enemy through breeding. Yeah. I mean, you know, they've got they've, you've got your values, rounds. <laughs> right? Yeah. No, no. So, so I mean, you know, you know, characters in Star Trek need to have values. So the Tribbles have a value. So something like you know, hunger is a constant state of being. Um, you know, you've got different sub specializations. Uh, you've got uh, uh, different upbringings. You could have been a beloved pet. Uh, you know, so you get the good Tribble ability. It could be a wild creature for the stealth. You know, and so on. Uh, you could have, you know, your Starfleet history, you know, you could have been a science experiment, perhaps a, a communication officer brought you as a pet. So, um, so yeah. No so one anyway, ever suspects the Tribble. They make perfect spies. Exactly. So, all right. So intelligence that's... is kind of a barrier to like espionage intelligence gathering, but still with training, you can buy that up. Indeed. They, they do have plus one to insight on their attributes. Oh, God. <laughs> All righty, so that's all I've got for this week. Okay. All right, well, then we should rush along to our uh, our, our top seven, I guess, of this week. Yes. <laughs> and this by top is, seven, uh... I loosely state that. Um, it wasn't... Uh, okay, so let me just state up front. I didn't suffer as much as I did last week. <laughs> um, so maybe it's getting better. I Yeah, I, I don't know. Anyhow, let's start with the... Uh, let's start off this is yeah, part four start. of our autumn anime season anime 2021 impressions seven new shows coming out this fall on a streaming site near you first up build dash divide hashtag septuple zero code black okay that so is seriously the way the title is is presented yeah, which is you know, by title alone, should just indicate, and then within a few minutes you watch the show, you know it's based on a card game. This, yeah, this is based on a collectible card game. So basically, it's a thinly veiled commercial for how awesome our collectible card game is. Um, you've got a girl and a boy, and they're both battle card players, and uh, she's got. I don't know, some desire to win the battle card tournament and defeat the reigning king and get her wish granted. And he's an amnesiac with a super powerful deck and a battle hoodie. And uh, they meet up, they go through a, a demo fight to show the audience how cool the card game is. And then they form an alliance to take down the king who lives in his techno spire in the center of the city. And uh, that's that's basically the whole premise of, of episode one. So I will take one exception to what you said, and that is that this is a thinly veiled commercial for a card game. There is no veil on this. <laughs> this is just two people playing a card game for like 25 minutes. That's it. I mean, they they put zero effort into this show. Aside from, you know, and, okay, so, so there, some of the visuals are okay-ish, but mostly not, frankly. It's just these two jerks playing cards with each other. Yeah, and they, they try and, you know, hype up the drama of, of like, oh, this special chain attack allows me to subtract 6,000 from the strength of all my opponent's cards. It's like, so what? I just heard that cards had strength like two minutes ago, and now you're saying that negative 6,000 strength is meant to impress me somehow and it's just like whatever it's it's, yeah, sort of, there's, oh, sorry, it's just like ahead. trying it's like introducing these concepts of of you know like how this card game works and then acting like gosh wow we're using the concept now and it's just like wow gosh i never saw that coming uh, well if you're interested in watching the anime and not purchasing the game, you can do that. <laughs> OJLink.com 5XY uh, available on Funimation. Um, I, I mean, is there really anything fundamentally fundamental to talk about here? I mean... Well, the, the power of this card game 
is so significant that the boy has amnesia. And it's not until halfway through the demonstration battle that it resonates with him and he gets his memory back and puts on his battle hoodie and realizes how to play the game again. It's that important a game. It's so important that he realizes he's in a a card game. Yes. It cures his amnesia and it makes him remember his destiny to defeat what's his face. Right, because it's a crappy car game and a crappy show. And Matt, Matt, it sounds like you've he- suffered amnesia here. I know there's a card game that can help. <laughs> it's not this, um, but I'm sure there's something else. So let's let's move along. Okay, this is available on uh, Crunchyroll subtitled, I believe. No, this one. Oh, oh, maybe I don't know. I found it on no, Funimation. I, I... So. Okay, well, it's either on Crunchyroll or Funimation or some other site. We're not sure. Yeah, yeah. OJLink.com slash 5XY. Okay, moving along. Next up is Komi-san wa Komi-yusho this, uh, or Komi can't communicate. And this is about um, an average boring guy at a school where everybody is a unique and eccentric student, except apparently for him. And the girl next to him is really, really shy, like to the point where when faced with any any social interaction whatsoever, she freezes up and cannot speak. And basically, he is like the only person that she can communicate with at all because he realizes that she's not just beautiful and aloof and withdrawn she is actually you know just terrified of social interaction and they they sort of come together and and he realizes that she can write things on the chalkboard that she wants to say and then he can like write things on the chalkboard back to her to be polite and they can communicate in this manner and that's that's basically what the the premise of this show is and uh, she she desperately wants to overcome her shyness, but she she just can't bring herself to do it. And making friends with this one guy is kind of like her first step out of out of her shell. And it seems like a nice show. The animation is good. Um, the credits seem okay. Um, Paul, what did what did you think about this show? So I think I, I'd like to say that the animation on this isn't just good. This is a fantastically directed and drawn show. Mm. Uh, I think from that perspective, it is absolutely one of the highlights of the season. Uh, with the care that's been put into this production, it reminded me a lot of Kyoto animation work. Mm. Okay. Uh, so this is not Kyoto animation. Uh, this one is, I believe, OLM. So, uh, but they've d- d- just did a, a bang up job on it. Uh, and, you know, the, the show is, you know, it's, it's quiet, it's gentle, you know, it's got its sort of, uh, its premise, uh, clearly it's going to be, you know, our main character, you know, guy who just wants to have an ordinary life, who's going to fail to have an ordinary life because yeah. he's uh, stuck in a class where everybody's got a deal. And that's yeah. implied in the first episode. We just find out about Comey's deal. Um, but he's going to be helping her make friends with all of these people. And I really like this one. I mean, I didn't there, find a lot to complain about with any aspect of this one. So, hmm. okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say we both recommend this. This is indeed an interesting show. And I'm, I'm curious to see where it goes. It's based on a uh, manga. So presumably they know where the story is going, but uh, uh, well, they've the got a, a no. They've got a long running manga, so they've got 23 volumes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I haven't read any of it, uh, but I but I I've got to say, if it the rest of the season holds up to the quality of this first episode, I really hope there's going to be more than one season. All right. So this is uh, subtitled streaming on Netflix, and do we have a link? Uh, before before that, though, this uh-huh. is something else interesting, and that is. There has been a Netflix jailbreak, as I understand it. So finally, Netflix is no longer keeping series locked up until the end of the season. 
they are going to actually be releasing episodes week by week. Ah, and so okay. that has been one of the most incredibly annoying things in this era of, you know, basically simu, simu uh, subbing, where mm-hmm. somebody licenses a show and a couple hours later, it'll be available for the U.S. market, except for Netflix, where they wait until the end of the season just so people can binge it. And I guess they finally realize that this is really freaking pissing off fans. So, yeah, there's a. Uh... There's sort of a, a freshness aspect to uh, to current television that you really um, cannot compensate for by being able to binge it later. It's mm-hmm. it's a it's a cold uh, compensation to like sit on something that everyone else you know has already seen, and you're just going to be able to binge it once the final episode comes out. It's like no. No, that's that's not good enough. I'm, I'm glad they've changed their policy on this. Well, at least for this one season, we'll have to see if it sticks around, obviously. But um, at the moment, I think that is a, a big plus. So, All right. Uh, uh, Blue Period, uh, which we discussed a couple weeks back, is another one on Netflix, which is getting weekly releases as well. And mm-hmm. so this is just a, a great development. All right. So, hooray! If you're interested... It's available on Netflix, as we just talked about, uh, oglink.com slash 5XZ. Okay, next up is Lupin the Third, Part 6, which is actually the sixth television series based on Lupin the Third, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is based on long-running and popular series Lupin the Third about the world's greatest thief and his gang of friends, Jigen the marksman gomen the samurai and fujiko the hot chick as they run around the world committing heists and getting involved in things that they have no business sticking their nose in all the while pursued by the intrepid inspector inspector zenigata and more often than not a police truck full of uh interpol cops and by long running the we mean 50 years because the the sort of a special first episode of this new season was released to coincide with the uh the 50th anniversary of the original lupin's release which is just basically modern animation but it's it's like an episode i've seen before the first part that is the the part that's not really the first part (laughs) so if if you've if, if you've been around anime for any amount of time, you've probably encountered this. It has been a constant. I mean, it was it was based on some fr- uh, series of French not well. It was inspired by, not based on. Should we say a series of French yeah. novels that were re- uh, by uh, uh, Maurice LeBlanc, if I recall correctly, uh, who was writing in this wave of detective novels that came out post. Sherlock Holmes, and uh, so the the gentleman thief uh, Arsène Lupin. So uh, this is you know very uh, loosely inspired, I think, basically by the name and the fact that this guy kind of steals things. But there's also references, and you know, in this first one, we have some some Sherlock Holmes. So uh, yeah, so we watched uh, episode zero and episode one um, for this, and episode zero is not really a a a, like a big overall plot thing it's kind of a a sort of small small self-contained adventure where basically the gang is is like pulling off a heist and the the local police are equipped with like these little flying drones that shoot bullets at you that shoot goop at you and can dodge gunfire and the cops have these dinky little plastic guns with computer chips in them and jigen is is just sort of ruminating on all on how the world has changed after they get caught by these newfangled gadgets and he's like the times have changed man i'm not sure if i want to be like a globe throtting adventure seeking you know thief anymore and lupin is like oh come on man we've had good times roll with the punches and Goemon is just like, I don't know, man. This it is beneath my dignity to fight, you know, flying robots with goop guns somehow. And uh, the the conflict of the episode is not so much 
Is Zenigata chasing them? Of course he is. Are they going to get away with their heist in the end? Of course they will. The, the tension in the episode is like, is Jigen really gonna just hang up his magnum and sort of retire to a life of genteel nobility because he can't be arsed to to deal with this like incredibly annoying new obstacle in the world and you know by the end of the episode he gets his mojo back but but it's it's mostly just to sort of like ease you back into the loop and universe and get you to deal with the understanding that yeah the world has changed since lupin was first created and we're going to be introducing new stuff in this series so don't be surprised when you know things like this that that weren't in the original series pop up to to harass our heroes uh, look if you are familiar with lupin you basically have seen this episode before probably but yeah. it's still worth watching yeah so i mean that's the that's part zero, and then there there is part one, which is really primarily, I, I guess, you know, where it, it kind of really legitimately starts. Um, but it's a good introduction. Part zero is a very much a good introduction if you're new to Lupin. Yeah, it, it's a, a really enjoyable episode as for, for both fans and, I think, new viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to to know much about these iconic characters. Uh, the animation's really good. I enjoyed watching it visually. Mm -hmm. uh, the voice mm -hmm. acting was excellent as well. Uh, the, and, and the pacing, right? I mean, at this point, the creators of this show are doing a really nice job just making the episodes work. Um, but as far as the, the episode one, I, I have to say, this is a point where we are breaking from the Maurice LeBlanc, Arsène Lupin <laughs> uh, continuity because Sherlock Holmes shows up and Maurice LeBlanc got in trouble for trying to use Sherlock Holmes in his stories, much as anime these days has to change uh, the names of anything. So instead of Sony, you've got, uh, you know, Bonnie, Pony or whatever. Banana. Uh, it, yeah. So, so, so Maurice LeBlanc was writing, you know, Arsène Lupin versus Herlock Sholmes. Yeah. So, well, so, this is I, also, you know, 50 years later, I think Sherlock Holmes is more in the public domain than it was back then. Plus, didn't Monkey Punch get in trouble with the Arsene Lupin estate for, for naming Lupin the Third Lupin at all? I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I, I'm not super up on the history of the franchise. I, I, I can uh, just say through yeah. the 80s, really predominantly the 90s, when I was really the most active, uh, clearly aware I was watching anime. Um, you know, it was always fun to look at the background and see sort of the change of names, right? Bony computers and banana and stuff like that. Um, yes. So, yes, yeah, so we're look, Lupin has always walked some kind of fine line. This is a finer line. Um, this is the thinly veil. <laughs> Thinly, yeah. thinly, and in no. case you're worried about time travel or something, this is not time travel. This is, you know, set in Britain in the present day. And there just so happens that Sherlock Holmes is a contemporary um, consulting detective who, you know, helps out Scotland Yard. And yes, indeed, his contact at Scotland Yard is Lestrade. Um, the only like real divergence from continuity is that there's no Dr. Watson around. And Holmes has a young girl um, as his ward, I guess. I'm presuming she's like some child that was like, you know, orphaned in, in some previous, you know, horrible criminal case. And, you know, he sort of like adopted her to prevent her from like winding up in a child brothel or something. I don't know. Um, so that's that's basically the the big divergence from continuity. And Lupin is in Britain to investigate this mysterious organization called Raven, which permeates the the top of the British society and government somehow. And uh, you know they're up to they're up to nefariousness, and Lupin wants in on it. I guess. Yeah, I we'll guess this out. is a general recommend unless you're really super hardcore Lupin and then, you know, you might you might take some issue. Um, 
Uh, I will say uglink.com slash 5y0 available on high dive. Uh, and I will leave it to the both of you to determine where we end with this conversation. Okay. Um, Paul, do you have any further comments on? on nope. I mean, I, I think, I mean, if you've watched some Lupin, uh, this is a good more Lupin. And if you have it, this is a fine place to start. I mean, this is just an easy show to recommend. Okay, cool. Uh, next up on our hit parade of new anime is Platinum End, uh, which is half hour based on a manga uh, set in contemporary Japan. And it opens up with a high school graduation, which is normally a occasion for sentimentality and looking to the future, you know, honoring the past, evaluating your life and deciding what future you want to make with your life. Except for our protagonist, who is a despondent young man who's about to jump off a rooftop because his life is awful and he wants no more of it. And after he flings himself off the ledge of the roof, he plunges to his death, except he doesn't, because halfway to the ground, he is intercepted by an angel, a cute girl with angel wings who is invisible to everyone else. And she says that she is his personal guardian angel, and she is here to basically bestow some powers on him so that he can achieve happiness and freedom and all these things which his life uh currently lacks in spades and uh it's kind of an interesting premise because the angel girl is to my mind not what you would call real concerned about the welfare of people in general um she seems perfectly fine with stealing things, mind controlling ordinary people, and in fact, causing the deaths of ordinary people. Um, she's just primarily concerned with our protagonist because she's his guardian angel. And I guess the, uh, the, the flip side of this is everyone else can go hang. Um, what do you think of this plot? Okay. So, so, one thing to say about Platinum End is that it is uh, based on a manga uh, created by uh, Tsugumi Oba and Takeshi Obata, who are best known for Death Note. Ah, uh, a pedigree and they were I was also not aware of. Ah, okay. So they also did another show called Bakuman about uh, creating anime, where there is a, a pair of, of excuse me, not anime, a manga, where the, it's about a pair of manga creators uh, who have kind of a hit, and then they're trying to come up with their next hit. And so they're throwing just like stuff at the wall to see what sticks. And so mm. they come up with this like lame high concept premise and hope that it gets some traction. And this is really what this is feeling like. I mean, this is feeling <laughs> like they were just throwing some stuff at the wall. And so they came up with, you know, okay, here's our thing. You know, we're just going to give these 12 people magic angel powers. Uh, we're going to make them all psychopaths and fight. So this is sort of a death game sort of show. Uh, reminded wow. me a lot of Midlai Nik Niki uh, Future Diary. Uh, and yeah, this is, I mean, this show's main premise is people suck and we get to watch them die horribly. Um, there's not going to be much actual, like, the, you know, concern about morality. I mean, that's sort of, it's, it's the, if there's an expression of morality or ethics, it's only to heighten the shock of our protagonist who is nonetheless going to be offing people because he just wants to survive the poor deer. Yeah, um, the the girl angel shows up to bestow angelic powers upon our mopey and depressed protagonist. And these are powers like the red arrow of love, which basically is an irresistible mind domination thing such that if you hit people with this, they will 100% eternally love you to the point where if you say 
you suck. I think you should die. They will gladly kill themselves. <laughs> and then the white arrow of painless death, which is for finishing off doomed but suffering people, but it will kill anybody regardless of whether they're doomed or suffering. So he's got instant death and total mind control. And he's also got angel wings, which I guess give him like super speed and the ability to fly. So basically he can just steal stuff and never face any repercussions for it because he can just grab things and vanish. Um, so the, the final you know, twist on this is that at the end of the episode, she's like, oh, I forgot to tell you about God. And he's like, what about God? And he's like, well, God is dying or retiring or something. And so we need a new God. So we're giving a whole bunch of uh, doomed people angel powers so um, y'all can, I guess, fight it out for the ability to become the next god. He's like, ah, I was not previously aware of this. And she's like, yup. Yeah, this is not the greatest series. <laughs> so so I, it's got some nice production values, but it is just a, I mean, I just found this deeply unpleasant to watch the entire way through. I mean, there wasn't, I mean, it's, the, the characters are so broadly drawn. They're just these caricature-ish, either, you know, wide-eyed or just over-the-top, uh, cacklingly awful people who, you you know, their only purpose in life is to be killed to show that it was appropriate that they should be killed. Uh, that our one shot of, you know, one of the other people with powers is, you know, clearly he's a psychopath who's just killing people because he could kill people. Um, and, you know, I am not really a fan of this. I mean, there's plenty of death game sort of anime out there. I am not typically a fan. And this one is of a, sort of a lower grade than many of those. So not a recommend from me, uh, though you can probably get from that uh, description whether it's going to be something in your wheelhouse. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that episode one is is just universe introduction set, you know establishing powers and they're going to develop it more from here um i mean death note starts off with a with a pretty awful premise um which is well what would it be like if you could just you know kill people with impunity from a distance just write their name in a book and they die haha -ha. and mm. then it developed into something more than that like well what do you do with this power do you use it? Do you abuse it? Do you do awful things in the name of a, a lofty goal? Um, and maybe that's there's more of that uh, to come further down the road for Platinum End. Um, I don't know. Maybe. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> you can see uh, how much mileage this thing would have with me. Um, if you are interested for some reason, oglink.com slash 5y1. Okay. Available so, crunchy roll. Thank you. Next up is Saihate no Paladin or the Faraway Paladin. And this is kind of loosely an isekai story, I guess. Uh, so like so many there's of these a, isekai, a, if you it the isekai aspect adds exactly nothing. It's yeah, this it, like it's like an appendix, you know, a verbiform appendix, which the only purpose is to introduce bacteria into the show. Um I, I mean it, it it's like, okay, he's from another world. Okay, that's it. We'll never mention this again. Yeah, it's it's literally a throwaway line where if you cut it out, it would have zero impact on anything they establish in this universe. Okay, so I will say, so it is the thing, he's reincarnated as a child, which often happens in these shows, we've seen it over and over. And so this explains why this three-year-old is able, to, this three-year-old has only seen these three undead caretakers in his entire life, actually knows they aren't human. Right. And he's different. And he is a human. Right. And I'm like, what the, what's up with that? It's like, I, at least this isn't an isekai. It's like, oh, he knows this because this is an isekai. Oh, well, that just destroyed that. Yeah. Um, this is a, a, a fantasy, you know, swords and sorcery universe. And our protagonist is a young boy who is being raised in a temple by three um, undead caretakers. Um, 
the basic premise of this universe is that there are six gods in the local pantheon one of whom is the god of death and the way the undead work is they're not like mindless skeletons raised by necromancers they are more like ghosts they are human beings who when the time came to die they had so much baggage with the world that they were willing to strike a contract with the god of death to preserve their earthly existences in exchange for for basically becoming you know beholden to the god of death afterwards so you've got a ghost who is sort of a magic tutor for our young protagonist um a beautiful priestess who we are told is a mummy although she doesn't look like any kind of mummy i've ever seen and a gigantic warrior skeleton dude who teaches the child combat skills and our protagonist is a young child who is being raised in seclusion by these three technically undead um, guardians and i get the feeling that they are like an adventuring party of a magic user cleric and fighter who basically were were trying to you know accomplish some mission of good and then they failed and they basically laid down their own lives trying to accomplish this mission and they failed and so they bargained with the god of death to give them one more chance to make things right by by raising a hero a paladin this young boy with who is a spirit from another world that they can raise him to be the proper hero to you know defeat the evil that they never could in life and i think that's sort of what the backstory is although this is pure speculation on my part yeah so so uh that the characters are you know, meant to be sort of drawn against type. They're, you know, scary undead, but they're actually just, you know, really caring parental figures, each with their lessons to learn uh, or, or lessons to teach to our our growing protagonist as he's, you know, brought up in the ways of, of magic and battle and uh, practicality, you know, just sort of the, what it, conducting life, growing gardens, uh, making food, that sort of thing. Yeah, and uh, he also it needs uh, the 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 fighter is or the warrior is teaching him. It's important to learn to take life. So it is as a content warning note should be noted that he does snap the neck of a bird at one point. Um, yeah, and there's he's not happy about this. But you know we then like, pan back to show that there's a string of like tw- two dozen birds that the the warrior's carrying along to try to teach him this lesson. It's like oh well, you got to eat, you know. Yeah, it's like really sorry, but. You know, you you have to kill animals before you can eat them. Um, that's just part of life. It's, life is harsh, man. <laughs> Meat doesn't come from the grocery store in this world. It runs around nuzzling its young with almost human-like affection until you kill it. So, so we had another uh, isekai. No, was it isekai? It wasn't isekai. Another show, sort of a, with a similar concept, where there was a, a protagonist starting off on a uh, a world where he was raised by robots in a decaying theme park. Mm-hmm. Um, but their their purpose in that show was to sort of launch him out into the world, uh, and that did not happen in this first episode. Right. So there's clearly going to be more of his you know, daily life with these three figures. So, I mean, with, with anything like this, it feels like they're being set up as, you know, the the mentor figures who who must die. So the protagonist can be launched into the next phase of his career. Uh, mm-hmm. Not clear. The other thing, though, is that so many of these isekai are really leaning into we have to be safe and comfortable. Right. We cannot actually have any real threat to the protagonist. And so I have no idea, as I've not read the source material, which way this is going to go. I know a lot of people do like the novels. So I think as Isekai go, this one's actually better than many. I mean, I'm willing to give this one a shot, in fact. Yeah, just as a as a straight fantasy story, this might be kind of an interesting one. We'll see how it goes. It, uh, it didn't piss me off when I was watching it. And I was actually <laughs> somewhat intrigued by, by the premise of, Okay, this is a pretty 
unusual situation where you've got, you know, quote unquote, undead guardians raising a, a hero child. So I'm like, that's something I have not seen before. Um, although anime is, is pretty good about sort of having a foundling child who is raised by a family of unusual hero types um, mm. for a greater destiny as, as sort of a, a common story thread. Well, if you are interested, um, it's available on Crunchyroll, oglink.com slash 5Y3. All right. And our penultimate uh, item on this week's seven show list is Taisho Otome Otogi Banashi, which is Taisho Otome Fairy Tale. And if you're wondering what Taisho Otome means, Taisho refers to the reign of the Taisho Emperor, which is roughly 1920s Japan. Um, this is something you'll see a lot in, in Japanese animation. They'll refer to things as the reign of the emperor in which it occurred, as opposed to just a flat out Anno Domini um, common year reference. So um, I remember in Lupin the Third at one point, Lupin was mocking Zenigata as a real Showa era man, meaning he was raised in you know, the time of the Showa emperor, which was you know, the 70s and 80s. Um, and Otome refers to a young maiden, more specifically a young maiden video game where it's sort of a reverse harem thing. We've got a young girl with a bevy of handsome young men that she has to, you know, decide who she loves the most. So actually that is a sort of a, that is derived from the Otome meeting. So Otome is just meeting a young girl. So mm -hmm. Otome game is one targeted at them. This is actually not an Otome game adaptation. Okay. Just but it is kind of a romance though. Uh, yes. It's a kind of an age gap romance, I guess. Yeah. The, the basic premise is that during the 1920s, a young man of a wealthy family, um, but one that is all about position and money and maintaining its social standing is involved in a terrible car accident where his mother is killed and he is so badly injured that he can no longer really use his, his right arm. And in disgust, the father of the clan writes him off, exiles him, to the family country house with a small pension and everyone basically tells him that he's a horrible you know useless human being now they wish that he had been killed and their mother had lived and they're glad to see the the back of him and he basically gets sent off to the countryside at a very young age like 12 years old to basically you know live and hopefully die and rid the world of his miserable uselessness and some years later his father decides that well to keep up appearances he really needs to be married because it would look worse for the family image if he wasn't <laughs> so they have some people that they lent money to and the people are no longer able to pay the money back so to cancel out their debt they say fine we'll take your daughter in dowry and you know and cancel the debt as her dowry i guess somehow and so they they have this schoolgirl who is basically plopped into an arranged marriage with this guy with the bad arm and she one day shows up in the countryside and announces that, hi, I'm your new wife, or I will be as soon as I'm of age. Is there anything I can do to make myself useful around here? So she's 14 when the story opens. I believe it's mentioned marriageable age as 15. Oh, okay. So she's not technically that far on the unmarriageable side but still she's 14 years old she's 14 and i think our protagonist is uh 17 so this isn't quite as skeevy as it might be it's you know it's moderately skeevy but that's mm -hmm. not really what they're playing the show for i guess um so she is 
looking like this sort of uh, Yamata Nadeshko type, this that you know the flower of Japanese womanhood, uh, mm -hmm. who is you know the perfect the perfect wife, the perfect master of all the skills. Mm -hmm. uh, she's she's established in these flashback scenes as sort of the the mother hen among her friends. Yeah, I mean she is she is disgustingly competent, energetic, and wholeheartedly enthusiastic about helping out people and she shows up and our protagonist is is like you know drunk the kool-aid pretty deep at this point and he's just like i'm a miserable cripple my family hates me my brothers hate me my sisters hate me my mother is dead my father has basically disowned me and i'm just exiled to the boonies to live out my wretched miserable life and then die without bringing further shame on my family and she shows up and she's a you know friggin ray of sunshine in his miserable mopey life and he just can't stand it yeah. um she is sincere and helpful and cooks good food and you know helps him wash his back since his arm is is not really usable anymore and he is just shocked and embarrassed by by her wholesome purity and defection. And by the end of the episode, she's starting to get to him. Yeah, so this is, I mean, they're they're moving into the romance uh, pretty pretty straightforwardly here. There's a little bit of fan service-y stuff going on, mostly in sort of the concepts and sort of the idea of, you know, this beautiful young girl uh, who's showing up, who's totally devoted to some depressed guy and wants to make his life better, uh, which I think would be the, uh, the fantasy of many of the people at whom this show is targeted. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so it's a really well put together show in a lot of ways though um and it isn't like totally skeevy it's like skating on the edge and depending on which way they go like if they really lean into that i she's the perfect girl for to save this guy that's gonna be kind of eh. but if you know there's some hints there that like they acknowledge she's gotten in her life that you know this uh you know front she's putting up is maybe even a front to a certain level and you know she's just been ripped away from her friends to you know be given to this guy she doesn't know and in, you know in the middle of the country uh, so maybe this is a defense mechanism if they explore that if they make this a little bit more of a mutual relationship there could be something here yeah i mean you if you find out more about her backstory she is literally being sold by her family to cancel out a debt and they they mention that it's like 10,000 something or another's which I don't know what that is in 1920s money would be in contemporary money, but it sounds like it's a fair piece of change. So you have to wonder like how in the world could her family run up that much debt? And, you know, you get the feeling that she may be extremely competent and uh, helpful and endearing herself to her friends because, well, basically she gets zero family support and hanging out with her friends is her only way to like keep her head above water and you know being helpful and genki and endearing may be you know her survival mechanism for the world um so you may find out that in true in future episodes i'm not really sure um, yeah, so I'm, I'm I'm tentatively interested in this one. I'm going to give it a couple more episodes to see how it plays out. I'm not, I, I'm I, I'm cautious, right? But I think yeah. there could be something here, and I'm willing to give it like you know the three episode test to see how it develops. Yeah, I mean, even Ronma One Half is is kind of based on a similar premise where you have two teenagers who are just flung together in an enraged marriage, and you just sort of like hope and pray that a romance will develop out of it because otherwise they're screwed. Well, if you are interested in this, uh, oglink.com slash five Y two available. All on right. Funimation. Yahoo. And let's see. Last up is visual prison, uh, which is not based on either a manga or a lost or a light novel series. Um, it's an original series concept. 
uh, set in contemporary urban Japan. It's about rock stars who battle each other for the sort of prize of the Scarlet Moon because they're all vampires. Yes, this is about vampire rock stars. So every season, it seems, maybe every season or two, there's a show that I just cannot take. Like, I, I just cannot watch it. And I have to force myself to, like, do this. And it'll be like five minutes is all I can take. Then I have to stop. So it took me, like, two and a half days to actually make it through <laughs> this utter horrible disaster of a show. And it's not because it's, like, crude or disgusting it is just so cringingly painful and these prancing vampire boys just will not stop singing they just won't yes um episode one focuses on our protagonist a young man who is sort of out of sorts and uh, we find out why he's out of sorts by the end of the episode. It's because he's a half vampire and he's sort of coming into his supernatural nature. Um, but as he staggers around, he keeps running into vampire rock groups or more appropriately, rock groups that are actually secret vampires. Um, there's one in the, that he listens to in the subway station. There's another one that does a pop-up concert after he gets out of the subway station and then there's a third vampire rock group who pops up to challenge the other one um, at the end of their you know pop-up concert and at the end of the concert he he sort of like feels all dizzy and faint and a mysterious stranger takes him away um, to keep the vampires from killing him i guess and he discovers his own vampire nature and how it is related to pop music. Um, and, and basically the, the guy who rescues him turns out to also be a vampire. Surprise, surprise. Um, and he explains that our protagonist is a half human, half vampire um, singer. And that every year, sort of like the musical Cats, the vampires gather together to sing under the scarlet moon and win the prize sort of like highlander although i don't know what prize the scarlet moon gives them maybe it's your heart's desire maybe it's something else i don't really know Not okay really matt well, matt you have put your finger on it this show is cats with worse music <laughs> It's sort of Hold like on. cats the the terrible movie that I will never watch or the theater production. <laughs> I, I have not subjected myself to to the live action cats movie, so I, I I I think probably if you forced me to watch an episode of this show or the cats movie, I would choose this because it's only twenty three minutes. I mean, even though it felt like two and a half days, it was in fact only twenty three minutes. Yeah, um, the basic premise is that these three pop groups of vampires i guess are always trying to look for newbie vampires that they can recruit into their pop groups because every year they sing for the scarlet moon to to achieve whatever and i guess they always need new talent and any new talent they can recruit for their group is one less pop group to compete against for the favor of the Scarlet Moon. Uh, and each vampire's got their own special thing. You know, it's, I want revenge. I want to discipline you. I want to dance into your heart. And they all have their little deal that they, you know, sing and pose in proper idol fashion on the screen with their cute little visual K-ish character designs. Yes. Um, and that's about it. I mean, the, the big deal is that, you know, they're meant to represent three corners of the, of the philos philosophical, ethical triangle, I guess. One is all about nihilism and destruction and revenge and, you know, destroying all that is pure and holy. Another one is all about pseudo angelic imagery. And then the other one is, is just sort of like, you know, 
hard rock sort of love songs, but with with it, you know, sort of my immortal edge, I guess. So I will give them credit that they actually made music for all these horrible groups and it's horrible music, but it's different music, right? And typically in these idol shows, when they come up, they'll like cut away as soon as they start to sing for Mm -hmm. everybody, except like the one song they've paid for that will then get played six times over the next six episodes. (laughs) In this one, I don't know what they're going to do with the songs, but in this first one, everybody had their own musical number. And so while I hated them, they should get credit for that. Yes, and every musical number was distinct from each other. Mm-hmm. It had its own musical style and its own lyrics, and it was representative of of sort of the philosophy of the vampire rock group that that played it. So it was sort of like their theme song, their ethos. And I got to give them credit for actually, you know, buckling down and, and producing one unique song for each of our three vampire pop groups. So hooray for that. Um, What else happens? Um, Oh, our our protagonist sings with the mysterious vampire who rescued him, who, although he says he no longer sings for deep emotional reasons, which I'm sure will be strung out over the course of the series, um, they do sing together and the Scarlet Moon shines on our protagonist and bestows a vampire cutie mark on him in the form of a vampire tattoo that uh, I guess signifies he is a true music vampire and thus worthy to participate in the battle of the bands uh, that is surely upcoming. Okay, well, if you're interested for some reason, (laughs) I'm not sure why, (laughs) OGMink.com slash 4 y sorry, 5 y for. That is Do not watch this show. I visual... hate it with the with the with the the, 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 the burning of a thousand crimson moons. Yeah, it and... is subtitled and streaming on, I believe, Funimation. That is correct. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay, well, uh, that was not a good end. <laughs> there were a couple of things that were that were good this year. Uh, you know, let's let's look back on this episode. Um, we we got you know Komiwa. Komisan wa, Komisu desu, Lupin the Third, Part Six, and we've got um, Saihate no Paladin. Possible, possible good shows. Yeah, we definitely front loaded some of the front some of the real low quality stinkers this season. And yes, while we did end with a sort of a, a not a high note this show, but with sort of a splat of a water balloon filled with shit. Um, but but uh, there were, there's some actual good stuff this season that's going to be worth watching. And do we have like a part five? waiting in the wings i'm afraid we do yes fall is always a very busy season and i think we had uh, right in the neighborhood of 35 or 36 shows to get through and so wow. we'll, we will be watching another seven i think to uh finish up maybe eight i'll have to to check my count well we'll see so we've got at least one more autumn impression show coming up but uh there's there's hope there's you know not a not a total cause for despair not yet (laughs) okay well uh let's uh, let's wrap the show up um for all the things we've mentioned please visit our website www.talkgeneration.net or ognetworks.tv uh what else you can email us at otaka.generation at gmail.com uh you want to come in and hang out with us in discord you can do that oglink.com slash discord you want to become a patron oglink.com slash patreon okay I don't know do all things. Let's find um, something that has some statement on it, uh, whether it's fortune-like or not. That's up to Paul. Um, okay, so uh, do not demand for someone's soul if you already got his heart. Okay, so if they had stopped at the first part, like, do not demand someone's soul. Like, that's not exactly a, a fortune, but at least it's implied that something bad might happen if you do that, right? So at least it leaves it open to being a fortune. But the second half mean, makes it just a, you know, it's a sort of a, a, a weak attempt at an aphorism. So so no zero points. Sh- shouldn't they say their heart instead of, you know, qualifying? They're engaged in elevated diction by changing words.
you know, if you mess with the grammar, it means it's uh, it's more profound. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. Well, regardless, not a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> that was the key thing to close the show out. And we got to end with that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to that. As usual, please stay home, please stay safe, and please stay healthy. Until next week, have a good one.